Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Stronger Together with Brian Williams. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to log in and we'll start momentarily. We're, we're so happy that you're here today. Greetings, everyone. I'm Patrick Huey, ISPA board chairman, and I am so excited to welcome you to Stronger Together, Keys to Leading an Inclusive and Diversive Culture, led by the wonderful Dr. Brian Williams. We're so happy to have Brian here with us today. We in the spy industry are used to wearing many, many, many hats, but few people wear as many hats as successfully as our speaker today. Not only does Brian hold degrees ranging from business administration to organizational leadership, but he's also the founder of the acclaimed BW Leadership Academy, the Strong Leader Institute, and BWTV Online Learning. Additionally, Brian is the author of three books on service excellence and carries a wealth of experience in the hospitality industry from his time as Global Corporate Director of Training and Organizational Effectiveness for Ritz-Carlton. Nearest and dearest to my heart and to the hearts of iSpa, Brian was also the highly deserving recipient of iSpa's 2019 Dedicated Contributor Award. It is my humble pleasure to welcome Brian today as he shares his valuable insights and expertise on the vital subjects of leadership, diversity, and inclusion in our workplaces and beyond. Brian, we're thrilled that you're here and thank you for being with us today. Excellent, wonderful. Well, thank you so very much for that introduction, Patrick. It is my absolute honor to be here today. Um, first and foremost, I'm excited. I am tremendously excited because also for many reasons, the, this topic that we're gonna be discussing about stronger together keys to leading um, an inclusive and diverse culture is one that's sorely needed. It's something that we've been um, kind of overlooked or maybe perhaps even underlooked for many years in our country. And it's something I find myself pinching myself saying, wow, this is actually a national dialogue now and it's time. So I'm excited for us to have this conversation. Big shout out to the iSpa, the iSpa family, the iSpa community, Lynn McNeese, Crystal, Jennifer, Sammy, Nelson, everyone there who is, um, who's supported me over the years, given me a platform, given me the opportunity to be of service in such a way over the last 14 years. Can you believe it? So they, I, we clearly met when I was two. And they scooped me up when I was a toddler. And um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, um, uh, I'm actually in my 40s now, but if I've never got a chance to meet you, it's nice to meet you. And I'm looking forward to this program here today, Stronger Together, Keys to Leading an Inclusive and Diverse Culture. Now, we have five main objectives, five main objectives. We'll be talking about managing a diverse workforce and what that means. We'll discuss understanding unconscious bias. We'll also discuss addressing microaggressions and what that truly stands for whether they're intentional or unintentional. We'll be talking about effective and inclusive meetings and why that's important. And then lastly, recruiting a diverse workforce. When I say lastly, I don't mean least important because I know for a fact that that's something, that last point right there, recruiting a diverse workforce is something that many spas struggle with. And much like many of you who are on this call, you travel, you've traveled the world, you've been to many spas, and I think we can all agree that they can be more ethnically diverse and just diverse overall. So 
before we launch into the meat of the presentation, once again, thank you to ISPA, Lynn, and everybody else. Thank you to the outgoing ISPA board chairman, Garrett Mersberger. And I finally got to pronounce his last name right after so many years. So Garrett, I appreciate you. I appreciate the support, the friendship, the advocacy, the prayers from both you and your lovely wife. And also, I want to say thank you again to Patrick and congratulations to him on his, uh, um, and his um, upcoming chairmanship. And I know that he will continue on the great legacy of ISPA and more importantly, build an even stronger one moving forward, an even stronger one moving forward. Now, listen, we are going to be working today. We are going to be working today. So make sure you have paper or pen or pencil or iPad or tablet, something, because you'll be taking notes. I'll be asking you some questions that will force you to really think, force you to really challenge yourself, challenge your own assumptions of things. Hopefully, I'm able to step on a few toes, but not in a bad way, like in a loving way. And the overall goal is for us to come out of this stronger together. I don't mean this as in terms of the webinar, but by the end of today, by the end of this year even, we should be much more mindful and be clearer on the type of action steps each of us can individually take to create a stronger workforce. Because many times with this topic of diversity, inclusion, and so on, we think about it in a macro scale. Like we need to be more diverse and we need to be more inclusive. That's not even step one. Step one is to look at yourself in the mirror and say, what are my biases? Am I doing things that could be offensive? Am I unintentionally or am I intentionally excluding people from conversations where they need to be in those conversations? So that's what we're gonna be getting into today. So buckle your seat though. But I feel like since we're gonna be doing so much work, we should start off with some food. <laughs> this what we have here, this is a cop salad. And um, I'm showing you this cop salad, my, my wife, Lisa, who some of you know, Lisa, you know, she went to school to be a pharmacist. She got a doctorate in pharmacy and then she stopped practicing because she was so disenfranchised with how people are just using medicines and drugs as the ultimate means for health and wellness. And she stopped doing that. And now she uses a blog and videos and different recipes to say food is the real, real, real medicine. So she took this picture a few weeks ago and I hijacked it from her and I put it in this slide because I want you to look at the cop salad. And that's one of my favorite salads. I pretend that you went to a restaurant and you ordered a cup salad and you got the cup salad, but then you were told to pretend that all of the ingredients and all the flavors are the same. I want you to use your chat feature, use the chat feature in Zoom. I can see your chat. Use the chat feature and tell me what would you feel if the server told you, hey, you know, it's a cup salad, but all the ingredients are the same. They're all the same. Pretend all the ingredients, all the flavors are the same. Type in for me. How would you feel if you were told that? Michelle says boring. Emily says boring. <laughs> Lynn says, was it, was it Lynn, say? Lynn says sad. Catherine, super, suspicious. Interesting. Lynn says suspicious. Anna says it isn't what I wanted. There you go. Yes. Derek says disappointed. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I want to tell you, uninspiring. Dillian says uninspiring. Larissa says frustrated. I was in Istanbul a few, a few years ago. So I'm in Istanbul and I was working in a five-star hotel. I was there on a, on a task force, basically. And I, and I spent some time with the chef. <laughs> Allison says scared. <laughs> I spent some time with the executive chef. And I asked the chef, to what is his favorite dish to make? And I'm expecting him to tell me some, you know, fabulous stew or some amazing entree or something along those lines. He looked at me and said, he doesn't really have a favorite dish per se, but he loves, love, loves to make salads. I'm like, salads? He says, yes, yeah, salads. And I had to ask him, I had to ask him the follow-up question, why? And he said something to me that really stuck with me. And it's gonna serve as the foundation for the remainder of our talk today. He said to me, the reason he loves making salads so much is because salads keep you honest, okay? He said, salads keep you honest. And by that he meant, you can't hide ingredients in a salad. Whereas with other like hot dishes and such, the flavors can blend together. This, he says with a salad, each ingredient is key because you can, you can put it in, but you can't take it out. When you put it out, it keeps you honest. And I love that. So here's the link. The beauty 
and strength of the salad lies in the uniqueness and distinctiveness of each ingredient. I'll say that once again. The beauty and strength of the salad lies in the uniqueness and distinctiveness of each ingredient. In the same way, the beauty and strength of your team, the beauty and strength of your workforce, the beauty and strength of your spa lies in the uniqueness and distinctiveness of each team member there. No one deserves to be overlooked. No one's job is irrelevant. Every single person's job means something. From the receptionist, to the massage therapist, to the esthetician, to the, to, to the nail technician, every single person working there means something, all right? So I wanna just kind of start off there to kind of set, set the tone. And I believe that since we're gonna be going over these five main points that I shared with you earlier, I wanna kind of share with you my journey. I wanna share my journey and what this whole thing means for me personally and why I was so excited when I had this conversation with, with, with Lynn about doing this particular webinar. For those of you who don't know, I was born and raised on St. Thomas in the United States Virgin Islands, right? So I'm from a very small island. It's 32.5 square miles. It's 13 miles long. You can drive from one side to the next in about a half hour. Very small place. It's predominantly black. Most people there are black people, right? Of African descent. So that's where I'm from. So I grew up pretty much around black people. When I started working in luxury hotels when I was 15 years old, um, that's when I started to really work alongside and have managers from different walks of life, different parts of the world, yeah? And that was important to me. But no matter if I was on St. Thomas or later moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and then later I moved to the Washington DC area, which is where I still live. Now I live here in the DC area with my family. I've pretty much always been the youngest and the darkest person in the room. I've usually been the youngest person and the darkest person in the room. I don't mean, whether I'm a, a keynoting on a stage with thousands of people, I may be the only black person in the room. Whether I'm flying in an airplane or if I get upgraded perhaps to first class, or whether I'm in a board meeting or I'm in a business executive meeting, I'm usually the youngest and the darkest. And oftentimes I'll ask myself, why? It can't be that other people who are of my complexion, who are of my heritage, are not qualified. I would ask myself, why? Why is that the case? I personally never felt any malicious attacks. I never felt anything like that. But I was always honest to myself, why am I the minority in these settings? Because it's been years, it's been the same thing. But despite that, though, it never, ever, ever occurred to me that I couldn't do something. It never occurred to me that I couldn't achieve a goal because of my color or my race, my gender, or whatever the case was. It never occurred to me. I partly blame my parents, who are both extremely um, supportive people, but I also have to blame, blame with quotes, the amazing leaders who I was able to, who I was fortunate and blessed to grow up working with. And I'm talking about these are people who came from our works of, I mean, who, white, Hispanic, Asian, black, gay, Muslim, Hindu, you name it. I've had every leader possible. I've had like about 17 jobs, right? From dishwasher to concierge to housekeeping to HR to training to quality. I had many, many jobs in hotel business. I've had people from all walks of life. And the, although they were all diverse, all my leaders were diverse, here is what they had in common. Every single one of them treated me with respect. They all pushed me. They all insisted I gave my best and they all had high expectations of me. Every single one of them. And that's all you can really ask for. For you on this call here on ISPA, it's important that you make sure you, no matter who you're working with, whoever's on your team, respect them, push them, insist with them that you give, they give you your best and have high expectations. But I can't be naive. What if that's not your testimony? What if you've been working someplace you're working in an organization, in a spa company, whatever the case is, where you've been mistreated, you know, maligned, overlooked, stepped on, doors closed on you, ceiling shut on you, feeling excluded, uh, berated even. What if that's your testimony? Because that's the truth as well, isn't it? I'm not going to sit here and pretend that everyone's journey has been like mine, because I know for a fact that's not that's true. This is where the certain mindset you have to adopt. I even had to adopt it. So I wrote, as I was preparing for this, I wrote this, I wrote this quote 
For your own mental and emotional health, do not depend on other people's validation of your worth. For your own, for your own, for your own mental and emotional health, even spiritual health and even physical health, do not depend on other people's validation of your worth. Let me just pause right there. I want to get what your thoughts are. When I, when, when I, when I share this, what do you think I mean by that? Do not depend on other people's validation of your worth. And again, you can use, you can use the, the chat feature. And I can monitor my chat right here. Cindy says, believe in yourself. Beautiful. Exactly. Good. What else? Do not depend on other people's validation of your worth. Confidence starts within. Thank, thank you, Jessica. Ella says, others don't define you. Beautiful. Someone else. Anna says, you are always more than what people think of you. Vince says, Vince and Miami, ask yourself the question, is what you're doing passionate to you? Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. No one defines you but you. You have to know you're good enough. You have to know you're good enough. You have to learn and develop the habit. Sammy says, you define your own standards. Noel says, trust your instinct. Instinct. You know you. You have to get to the point where your biggest encourager, your biggest motivator, your biggest inspirer has to be yourself because you cannot depend on other people to inspire you, motivate, to encourage you. It's nice when it happens, but you can't depend on it to happen because it won't always happen. It's about saying my identity comes from the one who created you. Exactly. But one last word on my personal journey before we dive into this. There were three, there were three tips, if you will, three things that really, really, really helped me as I was coming up in my career. I had a pretty fast ascension. In my, in my own personal career, but there are three things that I know have, have really helped me. And, and I pray that they may provide some, uh, get some nuggets for everyone here on this call as well. Regardless of your demographics, regardless of your socioeconomic status, so your race or your gender, right? No matter what your team looks like today, on this, on this day, I think it's August 12th, three things help me. One, be competent. No matter what it is, be highly competent. Know that you know that you know what you're talking about, right? Which is an ongoing process. I have been speaking and doing conferences and things of that nature for, gosh, over 20 years now. I've had my own business for 14 years. I still am learning things on purpose so I can improve. Be competent. No one can ever take that from you. You'll be surprised how people will overlook differences in, your, in, in diversity if you're competent if you're amazing at what you do. That's number one. Number two, take initiative. Many of you here at ISPA who've seen me, we've worked together and over, over the years at the conferences and such, you know I talk about working like you own it, right? Y'all can nod your head, working like you own it. When you take initiative, ladies and gentlemen, you set yourself apart. Now you're working like you're the CEO of your job. You're working like you're the CEO of that spa. If you're an owner of a spa right now, if you're a CEO of an organization right now, awesome but insist for everyone on your team to work as though it is theirs, yeah? And number three, build relationships. Build relationships, network, especially with people who don't look like you, especially with people who you can learn things from. And as you're growing, as you're moving, as you're progressing, as you're moving, as you're moving, as you're progressing, always look back to see who else you can lift up. I didn't get here by myself. Patrick didn't get to where he is by, by himself. Crystal didn't get to where, to where she is by herself. Robert Vance, my good friend, he's not where he is by himself. Alexis, Isabel, Lynn, Tony, Cheryl McCormick, everybody, you didn't get to where you are by yourself. Someone else has to give you the opportunity to show what you're worth. So when I mentioned um, this thing about diversity, right? I wanna make sure that we're clear on what I'm talking about. I'm talking about background, your personality, personal qualities, work related. I'm talking about your family life. I'm talking so the background, I'm talking about your race, your culture, your religion, where you're from, right? Personality, what's your communication style? What, what are your sensitivity? What are your special interests? What are your hobbies? Personal qualities, what's your sexual orientation? What's your gender, physical ability, disability, your age, all of that. Work-related, job level, your level of education. I know people, I've been to events, I've been to businesses where 
all the VPs are by themselves, right? All the all the other senior leaders are by themselves. All the housekeepers are by themselves. All the nail techs are by themselves, and that's great. But I'm but we're gonna kind of address all of that right now on this call, okay? Family life, marital status, parental status, your socioeconomic status. Now, for those of you who've been attending my uh, webinar Wednesdays that we had every Wednesday from March through, gosh, it was early June. We did a webinar every Wednesday. You know that I like to start off with a special affirmation, a special affirmation, and I have different ones that I've written. The one I wanna pick today is called You Hired Me. We're gonna start, we're gonna read the You Hired Me affirmation, then we're gonna launch into this program. You hired me. And this is from the perspective of your team. Your team, no matter what they look like, where they're from, here's what they're saying to you. Trust me to make decisions. Involve me in the work that affects me. Give me a project and watch me accomplish it. Yes, I might make mistakes. Yes, you may have to coach me along the way. But the confidence I developed from trying can never be obtained otherwise. You hired me, now trust me. You hired me, now train me. You hired me, now equip me. You hired me, now support me. You hired me, now empower me. I am not just a warm body coming to work. There is more that I can do, so much more. All I need is a chance, an opportunity to prove I can do this. Your belief and investment in me will not be a waste. I am on a mission to exceed the expectations of every person I work with and serve. Today is a new day, and I am present, strong, and engaged all the way. You hired me. So if you're ready to get into this thing today, Stronger Together, I want you to type in your chat, let's go. Type let's go. I want to see it throughout the chat right now. Let's go. Yes. Alvin says, let's go. Sammy says, let's go. Anna says, let's go. Larissa, Vanessa, Julie, Elaine, Brent, Alexis, Dane, Gay. All right. Nicole, y'all look ready for this. Devin says, let's go. Raquel said, let's go. Todd is my man. Todd is in the house. Paige, Patrick Huey, let's go. All right, team, let's start. Verna Meyer said something that I really appreciate. Verna says, Verna says, diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. Diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think that that is so, so very appropriate. I really like that. You can have all the diversity initiatives that you want. You can have your checklist, your strategic plans, but unless you take on the verb, the action of including other people who are not like you, then it's just words. Then it's just words. Now, point number one, managing a diverse workforce. Point number one, managing a diverse workforce. Diversity, ladies and gentlemen, has to be managed. It doesn't happen by accident. As you know, diversity does not happen by accident. From a social, from, from a social psychology perspective, people tend to congregate with other people they think they have a lot in common with. Yeah? We can all agree with that. Yeah? So when we say diversity has to be managed, it means it's something that has to be planned because otherwise you will not have any kind of diversity in your workplace. When diversity is well managed, it creates a place where everyone is able to provide exceptional care for their guests and for each other. So here's point number one, check your own network. Check your own network. And this is where I want you to do some introspection for a few seconds. Do a little bit of introspection for a few seconds. And I want you to be honest. Do you primarily spend time with people who look like you? And I'm talking about your professional network, okay? Your professional, people who you do business with, who you hire, who are on your team, in your office, in your spa. Do you primarily spend time with people who look like you? Same race, culture, background, and so on. And then I want you to ask yourself, why or why not? And you don't have to actually put it in there. But why or why not? Why or why not? Because this is where you're going to start to have the growth. As you look around your team, does everyone look like you? Because unless you intentionally invite someone in, they will feel excluded. If you have a team of people who are all one race, and it's very likely people of other races, of other cultures, may not apply because they may not feel that they're welcomed there. Does that make sense? So it's important for you to, <clears throat> excuse me, reach out 
and do that. You have to also discourage any type of us versus them attitudes. No us versus them attitudes. <clears throat> Diversity is not only about the demographics of us all, but it's also about unity, oneness. I was in a spa, it was, the, the spa years ago, it was an auberge resort spa. I think now it's a Four Seasons, but it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's called the Encantado. It was right after that opened. They hired me to come in and you know, provide some training for everybody. So before I even did any training, so the staff didn't know who I was, right? I went to the spa, because they have an amazing spa. And I was in the lobby, I was in the lounge area of the spa. I already had my treatment and I'm in the lounge area and I'm a big tea drinker for those of you who don't know. I love green teas and white teas and such. So I'm getting my tea, but they didn't have any green teas at that time. So I asked a spa attendant, not a manager, not a supervisor, but a spa attendant, if they have any more green teas in the back. The spa attendant, okay, who was cleaning the spa room, right? Who was cleaning the lounge, she said to me, I'm so sorry, but we seem to have run out. And I'll do my best to make sure that we can provide some green tea for you before you leave. Please accept our apology. Get it? We, the us, the our. By the time I got back to my room, well, the little casitas they have, by the time I got back to my room, a box, they somehow they found a the tea. They went to a store somewhere. They got the tea in my room with a card. Gets even better. By the time I flew back home, <laughs> do you see? There was a box in my mailbox. There was a box that had sent tea signed by everyone on the team. But the reason I give this story, not only for the great service, but the us, the we, the hour. <laughs> I was in an airport years ago. I was flying to Baltimore. Right? I, I usually fly from Baltimore because that's not too far from where we live. We live equidistant between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. But I prefer flying out of Baltimore because it's an easier trip. And I love Baltimore. I go to that airport all the time. I'm in the city. My family and I go to the city all the time. So we, we, we love it. We went to Baltimore on that particular day. I went to the kiosk, went to print my boarding pass. One of the airline employees asked me if I needed any help. I said, no, I'm fine. I do this all the time. I got the boarding pass. Then she asked me if I wanted to check any bags. I said, no, I'll just do a carry on. And she said, good, because I wouldn't give them any more money than I had to anyway. Here's my question for you, Ispa. Who is them? Type it in the chat for me. Who was she talking about? Who is them? Who is them? Put it in the chat. The company. Kim says the company. This says leadership. Uh, Shannon says the man. Michelle says everyone but her. The them is the place that hires her where she collects a paycheck, which she probably uses to pay for her mortgage or her rent or her car note to provide food for herself, for her children, for clothing, the same them that she's now working. To me, that's called trifling. How are you gonna take money from people and then talk bad about them? If you feel like you have to verbally distance yourself from where you work, it's a good sign that you should not be working there. <clears throat> so no us versus them attitudes. Insist on that. In fact, if you need to do a little cookie jar, say whatever somebody says, they or them, put some money in the cookie jar. <laughs> do something like that. But it's very important that you dissuade that. Don't accept it as a normal part of doing business. Three, provide social opportunities to connect. I know right now in the era of social distancing and physical distancing, it's hard to kind of get together and congregate like we used to for the time being. Man, do Zoom parties, do Zoom happy hours, encourage opportunities for connection. But last but not least, provide promotional opportunities for every single body and be serious about it. Nothing is worse than posting a job, spa supervisor, spa manager, spa director, for everyone to apply for, but you already know full well you're going to give it to your friend or you're going to give it to somebody who you think you have a lot in common with. It just kind of, it breaks down morale and it erodes the culture. If you provide pro promotional opportunities, make sure it's genuinely available to everyone. When I was in St. Thomas, I was a line employee and they had a, at the Ritz Carlton in St. Thomas. And uh, at one point, the, 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 the hotel offered up a management and training program. You all know what that is, MIT program. <laughs> and many of the locals 
were complaining for years, like how the hotel always brings in these leaders from all over the place, all over the states and all over the world, but they never looked to uh, promote the locals. That was always a common thing. I'm sure some of you probably heard of things like that. So the, 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 they posted the position and your boy applied and I got it. But what was really annoying for me, a lot of the other people who were complaining about never being given opportunities didn't apply. Didn't even think it was worth trying. Don't ever let anyone rob you of your zeal to be exceptional. If you don't try, you can't blame anyone but yourself. I hope that, I, that you got it. So these are the four things. Show up. Thor says, show up. Don't blame anybody else. I've learned in my life, whenever I didn't accomplish something, that I didn't get something that I really, it's because I didn't want it bad enough. As I've said on a previous, previous webinar, failure will never overtake you if your determination to succeed is strong enough. And you know what I'll say as well? Only work in places where they see your value, where the organization sees your value, where the leadership sees your value. Yeah? And if you're a leader on this call, if you own a spa, you're a director, make sure that you are, you are running a workplace culture that is deserving of people giving their best. Otherwise, you have no right to ask for it. All right? So, who you are, hold on, make sure, make sure you get this right. Who you are as an individual, though, affects how you perform as a leader. Who you are as an individual affects how you perform as a leader. <laughs> we all know that. I want you to, real quick, List three words that best describe your personality. List three words. You can use the chat right now. Use, list three words real quick. I'll share mine after you share yours. <laughs> Becky says positive, and I know that because I know you, Becky. Optimism. Carrie says fair, love, compassion. Uh, Todd says grateful. Anya. Oh, what did I say? Dynamic, fair, balanced, Larissa says lively. India says energetic, hey, India. Cindy says friendly, approachable, professional. Great. Excellent, excellent. Patrick, engaged, grateful. Noel says encouraging, beautiful. My three words I would use to describe myself are, and I, there's many of them. Some are good, some are bad. But friendly, optimistic, and encouraging. Those are the three words I would use to describe myself. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because it's important to recognize your own uniqueness. It's important to recognize your own distinctiveness because as you are um, identifying and as you are appreciating your own distinctiveness, it will prompt you to recognize the distinctiveness and uniqueness in other people. And that, is, that should seem like a logical sequence of events. I am special and unique, therefore you must be special and unique. All right. Now, I also want you now, ladies and gentlemen, and this is, a, this is one for you. List anything from your life that influences how you personally view diversity. For example, how did the schools you attended or the teachers you had impact you? Um, did a family member influence your viewpoint on diversity? Yeah? <laughs> one, of, one of my um, clients works in a particular state. I want to see which, 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 which one it is. And that particular state has a, has a large Native American population. And he was telling me how there's just this, in certain parts of the organization, they have this anti-Native American sentiment, okay? Because there's this population that says, well, you know, they act so entitled and they're lazy, et cetera. It's all wrong, obviously. They get all this sort of thing. And that had to start from childhood. Like any other form of sexism, racism, all these isms, um, being homophobic, a lot of that stuff starts, you're being taught through childhood. Um, Paige says, Jesus loved all the children of the world. I love it. Larissa says, um, just realized you mentioned a trait that benefits others, encouraging. Nice. Lynn says, key mentors have influenced me in a positive way. Very, 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 very important. Extremely important. So as you're managing a diverse workforce, number one, pay attention to your own network and appreciate your own distinctiveness so you can appreciate others. And ask your team to do the same thing. These same two questions that we have up on the screen, use these as you want to create bridges, create commonalities. Magdalena says music, religion, therapy, modalities. Beautiful, beautiful. 
All right. So bias. Mm, mm, mm. As much as we like to think this doesn't happen, one place we never want to see bias is in our workplace. One place we never want to see bias is in our workplace. So I want you, I'm going to launch a poll. And the question up on the screen is, are people aware of their own biases? Mostly yes or mostly no. What do you think? <laughs> I will leave it up here for maybe 10 more seconds. So guys, let's just get on it. Go, go to your gut. Don't do a big, big formula. Are people aware of their own biases? Ah, mostly no is in the lead. 85% of you says mostly no. Four. All right. So I'm going to stop in three, two, one. All right. And I'm going to share the results. Hopefully you can see the results. 83 points. So basically most of you, 84% of you, 84% of you feel that most people are unaware of their own biases, yes? And I would agree with you. I would say most people are not. So with that being said, well, hold on. So, 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 so with that being said, there are two main types of biases. You have conscious bias and unconscious bias. This is important. Conscious bias, as you know, the ones that we're aware of. Unconscious bias is the ones that we're not aware of. And I wanna start with some transparency because I, for those of you who know me, you know I'm extremely, I'm very transparent. I share all my business. <laughs> my family and I, my wife and I, we decided that we're going to homeschool. Okay, so we've been homeschooling our children for years now. Our daughter, my, my daughter, she's going into the fifth grade, which I can't even believe how that happened. And our son is going into the second grade. So we've been homeschooling now for six years, because including kindergarten. Well, when we were, when Lisa and I, my wife and I were discussing this homeschool thing, we were talking about it and we were like, I don't know about that. You know, our conscious bias was, don't the homeschool people, don't they like live on farms and have 12 children and raise their own cows and milk their own goats and make their own clothes? It's not what all homeschool people do. And they, and they, and they, and they, and they have a bus and they, that was our conscious bias, clearly wrong. <laughs> We went to a homeschool conference and we didn't see any of that. So it was completely wrong and we absolutely love homeschooling. So that was a conscious bias I had. A conscious bias that I personally had. Um, what else? When we were moving from St. Thomas to Atlanta, Georgia, I'd never been to the South before, right? And every time I saw a program on the TV and I saw people hunting, they always had a Southern accent. So I thought everybody in the South hunts. So I was thinking to myself, when I go to the South, I guess, when we live in Georgia, people ask me about, we want to go hunting for the weekend. I'll be like, no, I don't hunt. That's not the case either. These are conscious biases. I was in an airplane, and oftentimes I get upgraded to first class. So this is a couple of years ago. And I'm actually, this is almost 10 years ago. It wasn't a couple of years ago. It was 10 years ago. And on that particular day, I had already, so I was speaking, I was able to change, so I was flying home, and I had my baseball cap, and I had on a hoodie, and I'm kind of comfortable on the plane. And uh, an older gentleman, white gentleman, came and sat next to me, and he kind of rolled his eyes. And then he, we eventually struck up a conversation, okay, because I don't let people, what people do affect my mood too much. And as we were talking, and he learned what I did for a living, and we were discussing, and we were having deep intellectual conversations, and he finally admitted, he said to me, that he hopes that I accept his apology because when he sat down, he didn't have the right energy. And I'm like, what was the energy? And he admitted to me that he saw me, he's just young black guy with his hat on and his hoodie and he thinks to himself, oh boy, here we go. And he said to me, he had me pegged wrong. You see, conscious bias and those things, the thing about biases, unfortunately, well, they tend to be wrong. Right? They tend to be wrong. We'll talk a bit more about that in just, in just a moment. But Unconscious bias, that's the one you got to be extra careful about because they happen under the surface and you don't even know it's happening. They can lead us to make premature judgment just about, to just about anybody. And unfortunately, the groups who are mostly inadvertently affected by unconscious bias are those gender, race, class, age, weight, sexual orientation. Those are the things that happens. So for example, preferring can like people apply for jobs you're preferring candidates with certain names or discouraging candidates who have certain names they may sound to this race or to that 
Um, gender bias, only wanted to hire people of a particular gender. Similarity bias, only wanted to get people who are very similar to you. How many of you, I don't know about you, how many of you have seen a, a workplace, a spa, where pretty much everyone kind of looks and acts alike? I want you to use your, your chat for a moment. Have any of you seen a workplace where people pretty much look and act alike? Whether it's a spa or your office, they're all from the same place? Yes, yes. Cindy says, yep. Catherine says, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it happens. <clears throat> it happens. But here's my question for you now, though. Here's another question. Can people hold positive biases? Do you think people can hold positive biases? Hmm? Absolutely, absolutely. I've heard actually one of my past HR directors from years ago, Kalithia says yes, Larissa says thank goodness. <clears throat> I have a past HR director who says, uh, yeah, you know, tall people, they, they, they make great leaders. Now, this is an HR director. He says tall, he said tall men are great leaders. Tall men are great leaders, you know? Or you know, all, all, all people from this particular part of the world, they, they, they do math really well. They get them any technology problem, they'll fix it. <clears throat> so, those, so those are some things that, that can kind of affect us. But the question here then becomes, what can we all do? What can we all do? I think step number one, Persians are excellent with hair removal. <laughs> what can we all do? I said number one, check yourself. Check yourself. You know, where I grew up, he said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. But really check yourself. Recognize, acknowledge, own what positive and negative biases you may have. Most of you overwhelmingly said that people are unaware of their biases, but let's stop talking about everyone and let's talk about you. Let's talk about you, boo. What biases do you have? I want you to really look at yourself. Check yourself what positive and negative biases you may have. Number two. Number two. Treat all people well. I make it a point personally to make sure that no matter who you are, no matter what level you are in an organization, race, whatever it is, I want to treat you, I'm going to assume you are a VIP. I'm going to assume that you're a VIP. And last but not least, spend time getting to know people who are different than you. And spend time getting to know people who are different than you. i never forget. So I was, a, I was a director of training and quality. I was a director of training and quality at the Ritz Carlton in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> that was a horrible accent impression, so forgive me for that. And we were doing a, a training exercise around valuing diversity. Isn't that something? Now, this is like 17 years ago, 16, 17 years ago. Now, so we were doing this exercise. And at the time, I, I'm like 25 years old. I'm 25, 26 years old, somewhere around there. And the exercise was for us to write down five interesting things about our, our own lives. And after we did that, we were supposed to get up and look at the room, look, look at anybody else in the room, of which there were about 50 people, and find someone who you think you may not have a lot in common with, and then share your notes. Makes sense, right? Man, as soon as we got up, another young man who was around the same age as me, he came over to me, okay? Young black guy, just like me, but he was in, he was in stewarding, right? The hotel, stewarding, washing, the, cleaning the kitchen, the dishes, or whatever the case is. He came over to me and we started sharing notes. He thought we didn't have anything in common. Man, out of the five things, we had four out of the five things in common. There are the places we like to eat, the music we like to listen to, even musical artists, even to the church, the, the church, all that. And he looked at me and he was like shocked of how much we had in common. So that's number one. But number two, when, when, when you're going on your lunch breaks, I know again, many, many of us are not back at work in a physical location, but go out of your way to eat with someone different. Like go in your lunchroom, go out and sit down with other people. I always made a big point of doing that. To go out, I would sit one day with the housekeepers, one day with the front desk people, one day with the bellman. I, was, I would make it a point to sit with different people because I wanted to make sure that I, well, number one, like I like to know everybody. <clears throat> but you get such rich conversation and make people feel included. And I would say the higher up you are in an organization, the more important that is for you to do. So here's my question now. What can you do when confronted with bias? I'm, I'm going to pause it for a moment, but what can you do when you are confronted with bias? 
I want you to use your chat feature. What can you do when you are confronted with bias? Right, hold on. Any responses? If you are confronted by what, what can you do? Address it in a kind and clear way. Be open-minded. Educate the team and confront it immediately. Politely address it with the person. Lynn says, call it out. Michelle says, pause. Listen, ask questions. Uh, Carrie says, ask questions to educate yourself. I love what you said, pause. Linda says, challenge it. Interesting. Uh, Gina says, stop, recognize it, take ownership. These are all very, very important. And I would say, number one, keep calm, for sure. Keep calm, keep calm. Resist the urge to say the first thing that comes to mind. This is where um, pranayama, you know pranayama, right? The breathing. That's where that comes in. Because you, if you feel like you're confronted with bias, your natural inclination oftentimes is to react, to get into fight mode. But it's important to pause and ask questions. And we're going to get into this in just a moment, but I want you to be aware of something called the fundamental attribution error. And I'm going to type it in. So forgive me for off the screen. I have a couple of monitors I'm working with. Can everyone see that? Fundamental attribution error. When you think that you may have had a, a bias or you're, you're the victim, if you will, of bias, I want you to also think about the fundamental attribution error. Now, what is that? Okay, so in social psychology, this is the tendency to blame someone's offensive behavior on a personal, a personal flaw or a character flaw. And you're holding on to that rationale as the only reason that person did something. So for example, you're the spa, you're working in a spa and someone comes in late. Well, the fundamental attribution error will say, well, that person is lazy, they're inconsiderate, they're evil. That's fundamental attribution error. You're, going you're, you're ignoring any other possible explanations and you're going straight to the one that is basically about their personality or their character. But what's another reason why someone may have come in late? I type it in. Anyone? What's another, the, the child is sick, car broke down, car accident, car issues, personal reasons, unforeseen events occurred, unexpected, all, see, the fundamental attribution error can open up an entire realm of possibilities that make way more sense. Yes? You're driving, someone cuts you off in traffic, the fundamental attribution error will be like, that person is this, and you start calling them all kinds of names and this and that. What, it could be that they didn't see you. It could be all kinds of things, right? I remember a few years ago, I was working and one of my colleagues was struggling with a box. It was a lady struggling with a box. So I offered to help her with the box, right? And she got offended because she was thinking that I was insinuating that she was not capable of picking up the box by herself. Now, I was not saying that at all. I saw she, was, she needed some assistance, so I offered the assistance. Yes, but the fundamental attribution error said, ah, uh, yeah, you're just trying to, you're being sexist, essentially. I was on a call, this is not too long ago. I'm on a call and I'm having a conversation with someone, a potential client. And as we're on the call, I'm also taking notes. I'm typing, I'm taking notes. She paused what she was saying and she told me that she was offended that I was there checking my emails and checking social media and doing all kinds of other things instead of listening in on what she was asking me about. Now, see, that's fundamental attribution error. You see what I'm saying? So I'm making a point now that if I'm gonna call with somebody and I'm typing, I let them know in advance I'm typing because you don't know what people are thinking. The, the reason I'm bringing this up, ladies and gentlemen, is because oftentimes when you think something is uh, negative towards you, it could, it's very likely, many times, that the fundamental attribution error is in play. Now, how can you address that? How can you deal with the fundamental attribution error? Step one, pause. Like many of you said, pause and ask yourself, why else would someone do that? What's a rational, what's another rational explanation of that? And when you do it, the floodgates open up. All kinds of perfectly explained things come up. Which brings us to this thing called microaggressions. 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 
Now, this is important because these are incidents in which someone accidentally or purposely, these are incidents where someone accidentally or purposely makes an offensive statement or asks an insensitive question. So let me show you some examples here. Are you the new diversity hire? But this whole thing about diversity and valuing diversity has been around for a long time, as many of you know. And I've, I've actually, I've actually been, yes, can you do threading? Alyssa <laughs> says, can you do threading? Yes. Oh, hold on, hold on. What, what about, what about, uh, you don't speak Spanish? I mean, seriously? I mean, you look like you're supposed to speak Spanish. What about, what about, um, so like, what are you? I mean, I don't even know, like, what, like, what are you right now? Oh, oh, how about when standing next to my mom, why is your daughter so white? Why is your daughter so white? Can I touch your hair? Listen, Linda, Linda speaking. My family and I, so last summer, we, one of our trips, we went to Bermuda. I went to Bermuda, me, my wife, our two children, and my son, Bali, some of you met him last year at Icebox. He has a lot of hair. Unlike me, <laughs> he has a pig, like a lot of hair. And we're in a restaurant in beautiful Bermuda, beautiful place. And one of the um, tourists, a lady, she came over and she's like, oh my gosh, I love your son's hair. And she proceeded to put her hands in our son's hair to feel the hair. And we had to kind of politely say, in a polite way, I'm going to just paraphrase, but can you please get your hands out of our son's head, please? You know? But these are kind of things that happen, right? I, 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 so I have one more. Why do you sound so white? Why do you sound so... So these are, we call micro aggressions, microaggressions. Here's something I really, when I see you, I don't see color. I want you to just pause for a moment and I want you to type in, why is this an issue? Can anyone type it in? When I see you, I don't, when, if, if someone tells you that, when I see you, I don't see color. Why, why is that an issue? It minimizes someone's background and ancestry. Beautiful. Color is a part of who we are. It doesn't acknowledge the person, their history, their culture. Yes. Aha. Carrie says, Cobb salad is so colorful and beautiful. So are humans. The idea is that we're all humans. We're all part of the same human race. We all know that. But when you say you don't, you see me, you don't see my color, then you're not really seeing me. Because like the Cobb salad, I am distinctive. And by glossing over that, then you're glossing over me. I have another one. Microaggressions relating to gender, right? Sweetheart, honey, right? Babe, I have been called hot chocolate. Okay, I've been called that. All these, those are micro, darling, babe. These are microaggressions, you see? I've been in situations where I know the person doesn't usually use this term, but they refer to me as, all right, bro. And I know they don't usually use that term because I've been around them, right? Sweetie, Cindy says sweetie, yeah. What would be considered a microaggression as it pertains to age? Anybody, type it in. Daniel, Daniel says the point is to not to be colorblind, but to be color brave. That's right. Old fart, boomer, at your age. Oh, these millennials, these evil millennials. Oh, wow, you look so young. You look good for your age, girl. Jessica says, look, girl. Yes, microaggression as it pertains, as, as it pertains to mental illness, mental, as it pertains to sexual orientation. The, the, all these things that you may be completely unaware of can impact you. So now let's get to the those of you who know me, let's get to the crispy part now, okay? Let's get to the, like, like what my daughter, Briley, I, I told you all about Briley, whenever she's eating something crispy, she calls it the good part, which means, yeah. so here's the crispy part of this whole story. When somebody exhibits microaggressive behavior, there's three main ways to react, three main ways. Number one, just like, um, Elsa from uh, Frozen, I was going to say Anna, but then my daughter would, you know, banish me. How dare you, such sacrilege. And Elsa is the one. Let it, you can let it go. Two, respond immediately. Or three, respond later. Those are the three main ways to react. Now, let it go. That can be emotionally draining to confront. 
even for people who, who don't mind confronting, it's still emotionally draining. Responding immediately, the, the, the benefits are that the details are fresh in everyone's mind. Responding later, you can address it with them privately to explain where, I was, so, where it was such an issue. So I wanna, I wanna show up a quick poll question here. I have a poll question for you. Which one do you use most often? When you feel like a bias or a microaggression has come against you, which one do you use most often? Give a few seconds there. So I'm gonna give it another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So here are the results. Here are the results. A little over half of you, 52 or 53% basically, says let it go. Most of you just let it go. Just let go and let God. 31.6% uh, says respond immediately and lastly respond later. But most of you will just kind of let it go. Let it go. All right. So, hold on. Let me just close this out. Here's a framework. Oh, here's a framework for how to address this. Here's a framework to help you determine which course is best for you in any given situation. And then if you decide to respond, how can you ensue an effective dialogue? So I'm going to give you a quick framework. And here, and, and, and here it is. Hold on. Number one, discern. Discern. Consider the importance of the issue and the relationship. If either is important to you, you have to respond. If either is if the relationship is important or if the issue is important, then avoidance is the wrong approach. Avoid a couple of years ago, I don't remember if it was two years ago or three years, I can't remember when it was, but remember when Brene Brown was the keynote speaker at, at Icebox? Do you remember that? Brene, who, who did an amazing job. She was a keynote speaker. And she one of part, well, part of her story, she uh, she had a, she said, everyone whose opinions matter to you should be able to, their name should be able to fit. Their name should fit on a one inch by one inch piece of paper. She basically said to avoid everybody, get a one inch by one inch paper, a small paper, and write down everyone whose opinions matter to you. And they should only be able to fit <laughs> on a one inch by one inch paper. So discern if this person is important enough to you, if this relationship is important enough to you. <clears throat> but even if the person is not, the issue might be. I'll give you a personal example. Okay. So I was working one time, I was working with a colleague. This is back when I was, um, before my, I had my business, I was working in hotels. And it was me and a few people, we were talking about food. We were talking about our favorite desserts. And me and a young lady, a Caucasian young lady, we were talking about favorite desserts. And then um, I said, I really like bananas flambe. And that came up. And then she said, no, nah, she likes this dish. And we started to get a, a playful back and forth about who likes bananas more. And she said to me, ah, just because you look more like a monkey doesn't mean that, that you're right or that you, know, that you like bananas more than me. That, you know, and she went back to her office. So step number one, I have to discern, is this important enough for me? And the answer is yes, very important enough to me. Now here's step two in the framework to help you decide if we should go. Disarm, disarm. I went over to her and I had to check my own emotions and check my own body language. Because if I came over there with, fin with fist clenched and teeth like this, and I'm ready, and I'm like a vein popping out of my head and all that stuff, then I'm not disarming anybody, right? So I came over, open body language. I didn't cross my arms, cross my legs, cross my eyes. Nothing was crossed. I came in. I asked if I could sit down. She said, yeah. I explained that the conversation might get a little uncomfortable, but what she just said offended me. See, that's step two. Now, watch this now. Step three, define, ask the offender to define or to clarify what they meant. Like, what, 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 what you said, monkey, what did you mean by that, right? I have to explain to her, like, how that has major racial connotations, right? 
for black people especially, being called that. And she was so, I mean, she almost wanted to cry. She was so taken aback that she didn't realize it. She says that ever since she was a little girl, her father always called her Cheeky Monkey. She's a, you know, she's a monkey. And she even had a little, fig, she even had a little um, a figurine of a little monkey and so on, right? So if the person is like, well, I didn't mean it like that. I was just joking. And if they're being very, very combative about it, then that's where you just pause and you say, listen, I appreciate your willingness to clarify your intent, but I hope you can appreciate my willingness to clarify your impact. It's important. And here is the fourth step in addressing microaggressions and uh, addressing bias and these kind of things. Decide what you will take from the interaction and what you will allow it to take from you. Decide what you will take from the interaction and what you will allow the interaction to take from you. And specifically, I want to share with you a quote from Laura Roberts, phenomenal lady. She says, let protecting your joy be your greatest and most persistent act of resistance. Listen, protect your mood. Protect your mood. As I've gotten older, I have become extremely stingy about who I allow to protect my mood. I don't have like the one inch by one inch paper, like what Brene said to have, but I have it in my head. I have a one inch by one inch paper in my head. And there's probably three or four people. <laughs> There's about three or four people who I can say, all right, their opinions will affect me. Otherwise, I keep it moving. I keep it moving. I keep it moving. Because if you allow your body to affect your, your mood, your opinions, then you'll be going all over the place. You'll never be um, productive and how brilliant you were born to be because you will always be distracted. All right? Let me just pause for a moment. Are there any questions? The time is flying by, ladies and gentlemen. Are there any questions? Any questions for me at this point? Rebecca says, thank you so much for this. I appreciate you, Rebecca. But any questions before us? We, uh, we have two more major points to go. We've talked about managing a diverse workforce. We've talked about bias, we've ta um, unconscious bias. We've talked about microaggressions. If there's no questions, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. The reason I wanted to put in a section on inclusive and effective meetings, ladies and gentlemen, because this is one of the places where people can really, really feel excluded. This is one of the places where people can really, really feel excluded. How many of you on this webinar right now has been in a meeting where you didn't feel like you were involved in the meeting? You were excluded. You were asked to come. You're in the meeting. You're on the committee. You're on the council. You're on the task force, but you feel like you're not in, for whatever reason. Yeah? Laverne says, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Linda says, absolutely. I have as well. Hey, I have as well. So here's a few things that I want to share with you. A, a few key things. When I used to be, uh, gosh, I remember back when I used to be an employee cafeteria manager, <laughs> I would have a ask me anything meetings. And this was once a month, I would get my employee cafeteria team and we would have a ask me, as she called it, a ask me anything meeting. <laughs> this is where they can say, they can ask me whatever's on their mind and I could ask them whatever was on my mind. It, it, it had to go both ways. Okay, so that, there was an ask me anything meeting. And that, the whole point of that was to create a culture of openness, transparency, uh, dialogue. Without, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, without dialogue, without communication, then you have nothing. Mm -hmm. I would say as well, if you're a leader and you're in a meeting and, you, and no one is speaking up, or worse, if everyone is agreeing with you, if every time you say something and people agree with everything you have to say, that's a problem. That is a sign of apathy. Every, you have to insist that people bring their uniqueness and distinctiveness with them when they come to the meeting. They have perspectives. Every single person has a unique, beautiful perspective. But what happens is that many times they've been trained that it's not okay to give their perspectives. Not by you, but in a prior workplace. Their perspective is not okay. So what can we do about this? All right, as a leader, as the leader, when you're having your meetings, keep the conversation on track when it diverges or gets repetitive. Call on people who have not yet spoken. But here's an asterisk, and I know that Linda Harding Bond can back me up on this. Be careful with introverts. Be careful with introverts, right? Be careful because not everyone um, 
is willing for, is, not everyone speaks up at the same time. There are a lot of people who need to process things. Yeah? Whereas like for me, I learn by asking questions that need to be involved, they need to be all up in the person's mouth. Some people need time to, some people need a day or two to process things. And then when they come and they give you their perspective, it's like, wow, that's amazing. So I had to learn that point. And I learned that point in London. I remember I was in London. I was, I was my company, my, 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 my business, huh? I was doing, a, I was doing a, an event in London for the businesses in London. And this was at the Landmark Hotel, beautiful hotel at Maryland there in London. And so different leaders from different parts of the community came, different businesses came to the landmark to attend an event I was hosting, right? And um, I didn't learn this yet. So this is maybe about 10 years ago. I, I hadn't learned this yet. And Mary Bone Road, that's right, Larissa. And I, and I, I was trying to get, be inclusive. I'm a very inclusive person. So I asked a question and there was a gentleman in the front row and he wasn't really speaking up. So I called on him. And I can tell his face just turned red. And after the meeting, he came up to me one-on-one -on -one and he said, when I called on him and I was insisting on him to speak, it took him back to his grade school days when teachers would force him to speak up when he, didn't, he wasn't really ready to speak up. And plus he had a speech impairment. And I can relate to the speech impairment because I grew up as a severe stutterer. Many of you know that. And he asked me, he says, please, he says, I may not ever see you again. He, this is him speaking to me now. He said, I may not ever see you again, but I want you to promise me that you will never do that again. He looked at, and he had tears in his eyes. That thing impacted me so much, you see? So I've learned, I may open the floor, but you have to respect if someone has hesitancy about speaking up at that point, all right? Now three, hold people back if they're dominating as a leader. <laughs> Literally says it like being asked to play the piano at Christmas. Um, as a leader, ask clarifying questions. That's important. Now, empower your team by reminding them to ask questions. Reminding them to ask others to say more where, about where they stand. Ask others to express their concerns that haven't been fully addressed. These are very important. Ask them to ask clarifying questions. You and your team in your spa have a right to ask for whatever you need to be effective in the meeting. Here's a principle I learned in Japan years ago. And it's from the, you know, I learned it visiting the Toyota plants and learning about total quality management. Remember when TQM was a big thing? Total quality management. So I learned a lot about that. And a principle from, from, from Deming, D-E-M-I-N-G, he said, to create pride and joy in the workplace, all employees have a right to be involved in the planning of work that affects them. To create pride and joy in the workplace, all employees have a right to be involved in the planning of work that affects them. Yeah? Create inclusion by at least verbally stating that everyone should be involved. Even given eye contact, you ask as your leading team, giving eye contact, looking to see if somebody wants to speak up. You'll be surprised just by giving eye contact or a slight nod or a smile in the direction of someone who are there in the meeting, they'll speak up because there they feel called on. It's very, very important. So to create safety and inclusion during a meeting, here are a few key tips. Ask the group to devote their full attention. And here is where I have to talk about cell phones. If people are on the, if you're in a meeting, people can't be doing this kind of thing like, this is supposed to be a cell phone, right? Cell phone, cell phone. No, 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 no. Ask, if you want to have inclusion, make it a rule. People can't be on their cell phones. If they have to use their cell phones, leave the room. Designate somebody to fill in for you while you're in the meeting. Or if you really have to take the phone, a phone call or check out a message, then leave the room. But it just creates this disrespect for the person who's talking. Two, share what is valuable. Three, invite people into the conversation. And lastly, ask, ask for suggestions. But again, make sure that you're mindful of the introverts versus the extroverts dynamic. Very important. So with that being said, I wanna, I wanna launch a, hold on, I have a quick poll. I want a quick poll. Wanna, this, this, this is the last poll that I have for you. Of these four, which one do you have the most opportunity for improvement? 
of these four, which one do you have the most opportunity for improvement? As if for suggestions to explain how you want to use, invite people into the conversation, sharing what is valuable about someone's question or comment, ask the group to devote their full attention. Which one do you have the most opportunity for improvement? All right, <clears throat> give me five more seconds. All right, I'm gonna stop the polling and I'm gonna share the results. Here we have asking for suggestions and explaining how you'll put them to use. Most of you said that. And right after 30% was sharing what is valuable about someone's question or comment. And that's great. I mean, I think for me, I get excited when I see OFI. So OFI is an opportunity for improvement. Because when you see an OFI, right, it says, this is where I can get even better. In the spirit of Kaizen, you remember Kaizen? K-A-I-Z-E-N, let, let me type it in. If any of you have spent any time with me on webinars or in classes, you know I talk about Kaizen all the time. Kaizen means continuous improvement. It means change, never ending incremental improvement over time. So by you identifying the area where you can improve, as it pertains to creating inclusive, vibrant meetings. You know what that means? The next time you have a meeting, you'll be asking for suggestions and explaining how you put them to use. The next time you have a meeting, you'll be sharing what is valuable about someone's comment. The next time you have a meeting, you'll be inviting people into the conversation who have yet, not yet spoken and being mindful about if they're introverted or extroverted. But the thing about it though, you can always tell if someone's apathetic. And you have to call that out also one-on-one, -on -one, private. All right. <laughs> so Sammy says all the introverts, thank you. Hey, Sammy, listen, this, that's an area I really had to study on and work on because I'm an extreme extrovert. If you put me in a room with a bunch of people I don't know, my natural inclination is to go and meet everybody in the room. I've always been that way. And now my wife, Lisa, she's an introvert. I mean, she, she can, she's very kind, very nice. She, like, she likes everybody. She meets everybody, but she... Um, meeting people kind of takes energy from her, whereas it gives me energy. So I kind of have to learn vicariously through her. And just by trial and error, like I shared with you that London experience, those kind of things really, they help me to be more inclusive, by right? being more mindful and being more respectful. So our final point here today is on recruiting a diverse workforce. How many of you on this call right now would like to have a more diverse workforce? <laughs> If you want to have a more diverse workforce, I want you to type it in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Abs yes, 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 absolutely. The f perfect. Yes, yes, yeah. Good. So here are a few tips that I want to give to you. Number one, develop recruiting materials that reflect visible diversity. Now, Make sure that you've already done the work of actually creating diversity before you start saying, all right, here's a brochure, here's an image that reflects how diverse we are, if you're not there yet. So this is one tip. Number two, assemble a diverse interviewing panel. As I mentioned to you, my wife and I, we homeschool our children. Up until the pandemic started, being honest, my wife was the real, she was a homeschool teacher. I was a substitute teacher kind of principal kind of person, but she was, a, she was a homeschool teacher. But since the pandemic, since like March, I've been at home much more. So I was, I've, been, I've, been, I've been the full-time first grade teacher. Yeah? So I've been able to do a lot more. So my, our children go to a, a homeschool co-op half a day, twice a week. Well, the, where they go to their homeschool co-op is not ethnically diverse at all. So I was recently asked to be on their interviewing panel to interview families who are applying to be a part of that homeschool co-op. I said, yes, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to it because ladies and gentlemen, you can't talk about wanting to see more diversity if you are not personally willing to become involved in something. I'll say that again. You cannot talk about wanting more diversity if you're not personally gonna be doing something about it. So I'm jumping in, I'll be starting to interviewing people, actually starting tomorrow night, <laughs> Thursday night. 
right? It helps to combat the just like me syndrome. I mean, some teams you see them, they're overwhelmingly the same race, same gender, same background, same socioeconomic status. That's important. Three, encourage the placement of diverse interns. Oftentimes, they can become your new employees. At the very least, they become ambassadors back in their communities if they've had a good experience working in your organization. Establish relationships with schools, yes, with different schools, and you get great diversity there. And lastly, cultivate partnerships with community organizations. Does anyone else here on this call have some more tips that we can share? Ways to recruit a more diverse workforce? Not just ethnically, but every aspect of diversity you can imagine. What are some other ways we can recruit a more diverse workforce? Any other tips? I'm looking at my chat. You see me looking over here? This is what the chat is. Consider, Brent says, consider your suppliers. Excellent. What else? Any other example? Any other example? Ways to diversify your recruitment efforts? Apprenticeship, apprenticeship schemes. Absolutely. What else? Establish relationships with all schools in your community. Mandy says, work on your biases. Exactly. Hey, yes. I, I've, seen, I've seen some interviewers who would actually discard applications if the person's name sounded too ethnic. Yeah? Um, Deborah says, advertise in ethnic publications. Lynn says, internships. Bridget says, getting involved in community groups. These are all very important. These are all, I think, if we start with our heart and say, you know what? We need to be more diverse. We need to really, really capture a workforce that's reflective of our clientele, reflective of the community that we're in, reflective of our guests that we're serving. If you start there, all of the right solutions come to you. But if you don't, then again, like I said earlier in the call, naturally, people tend to congregate with others they feel they have, in common, they have things in common with. So as we do a uh, recap, number one, managing a diverse workforce. We talked about checking your own network, the us versus them scenario. Make sure you, we, us, our. Um, make sure you, you have promotional opportunities for everyone. We talked about understanding unconscious bias, being aware of your own, treating all people well. Fundamental attribution error, be aware of that. Pay attention to the fundamental attribution error as well in your house, in your home, in your intimate relationships. You'll be surprised. And the thing about biases and the fundamental attribution error is that they're usually wrong. The thing that you're insinuating is usually incorrect. Three, addressing microaggressions. I mean, look at, look at the three main ways to react, right? The let it go and react immediately, react later. Don't forget the 4Ds framework. And I'll make sure that uh, Crystal and the Ice Bar team has a PDF of these slides to send out to everyone here. So that's my gift for you. So don't say I didn't give you anything. The 4Ds framework, discern if this is even important to you. Disarm the person by your body language and inviting them into a discussion about it. Define, uh, have, to have them define what they were talking about to explain what their, what, what, what their intent was. And lastly, and most importantly, decide what this will do to you, what you will take from it. Don't let anyone rob you of your zeal. Four, the fourth point we had was how to have effective and inclusive meetings involving people, reaffirming contributions, insist that everyone gives the speaker their undivided attention, and lastly, recruiting a diverse workforce. Have a diverse interview panel. Go out and invite people to apply. Don't passively wait for people to, for your organization to become magically more diverse. Go out in your community, you go a place, you go to a restaurant, you go this, and you see, you know what, this person would be amazing working in our organization and invite them to apply, just set up plan and see what happens. Those are the kind of things you do to create more diversity. So I'm gonna shut up right now and I'm gonna just pause and see what questions, what comments do you have? What questions are coming, because I know we're, we've kind of run over a little bit, so just bear with me, but what questions or what comments do you have? Or what stood out for you? Or, or more importantly, even, what are you going to apply? What is, it, what is your takeaway from this session today? Stronger together. Keys to leading an inclusive and diverse culture. What's your takeaway? What's your, tell, tell me. I want, I want to hear that. 
Cindy says her takeaway is don't judge someone by face value, but rather what they can bring to the table. Lynn says, thank you that you are awesome. Uh, pre you are awesome too, Lynn. You're more awesome -er. Michelle says, be more aware of where biases may be. Anat says, recognizing our own biases and addressing them. Do that first. Beautiful, Anat. Um, okay, Brent says, let me see. Brent says, what would be your advice in implementing a diverse equity and inclusion strategy? I would say, number one, like I said, start with yourself. Start with your own biases. Start with what's been holding you back. Start there, personally. This is a personal, introspective moment. Then, I would say, establish a diversity council, a, a group of people from different levels of your organizations, different, a place that has representation from the various stakeholders. Get a council together to address this specifically, and then start implementing things then announce to the organization, then you can announce to the world what you're doing, but don't make the mistake that I saw so many people, so many companies doing uh, when the whole Black Lives Matter thing kicked off back in April, I guess. They started putting out statements uh, publicly, but in their own house, things were not diverse at all. Then they got called out on it, right? On Instagram and different places like that. So I would say start yourself personally, right, introspectively, and then put together a council representing different parts of your organization and of, well, make sure that the council is diverse, right? <laughs> that sounds obvious, but make sure it's a diverse council. Then start implementing things. Then you can announce what you're doing. I would say do it in that order. All right, uh, Linda said the fundamental attribution there was powerful. Carlithia says, I love your energy. Thank you. Becky says, open your heart and listen to it. Molly says, love the push, Molly Golden in Tucson, love the push to provide more social opportunity to connect. Our team really needs that right now. Brent says, thank you. Good. So it seems like everyone, or most of you at least, took something away to immediately apply. And that's all I care about. If each person on this webinar took something that they can use, I'm grateful. I'm happy. I can go to sleep right now and say I did my job for the day because everybody took away something. Here's a great quote from Cynthia McKinney. We are way more powerful when we turn to each other and not on each other, when we celebrate our diversity, focus on our commonality, and together tear down the mighty walls of injustice. Let me tell you some team, we need each other. One of the reasons I love coming to the Ice Bar conferences, this is probably the only conference I go to every single year that I actually come to attend, I love the how people are just one big family, but it can't just be in social settings. It has to be professionally as well. For those of us who have a, a leg up, who may be in a position of influence, man, make the opportunities available, reach out, create connection, build bridges, talk, do those things. And then really look at yourself. I think that's the biggest takeaway. Look at yourself and say, what can I do today? What can I do today? So, Robert says he's grateful for me. If you're not following me right now on um, Instagram, which I started this year, <laughs> after much nudging, LinkedIn, many of you follow me on LinkedIn already, um, Facebook, if you're not having our newsletter, we send out emails and articles and resources and video clips every week, um, sometimes twice a week, but they're usually short, some things you can take, use that for your inspiration, for, your, for, for whatever that you need to get through, and to just kind of keep the momentum going. And my last point, before I turn it back over to the ISPAR team, is we have a program called uh, Motivational Moments. It's a custom monthly videos we produce specifically for your organization. They're five to seven minutes, and we talk about different topics, whether it's, it's me providing a training on whether it's service recovery or anticipating needs or peer-to-peer -peer accountability, you name it. But the key is that I'm customizing the video for your team and for your organization. The website, I'm gonna type it in if you wanna get more information. If you're interested in bringing that to your team, it's called your, hold on, your motivation, no moments. That your motivational moments .com. I almost messed it up. Your motivational moments .com. I will make sure we include a link to this as well in the follow up materials for anybody who wants to have those monthly custom videos customized with your mission statement, vision, values, and so on. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to my colleagues, Crystal. <laughs>